Welcome to the video. In this 3D printing for remote control video, we're going to take a look at actually designing your own parts. Now here there's a selection of stuff that I've designed and printed, and it's on here to actually show some of the tips and tricks and also considerations when you actually start to design your own bits for remote control. Now some of these are remote control bits, uh, I'll go through those and you'll spot some of them already, things like replacement arms for quadcopters and we've also got things like uh, wrenches for the 10mm nuts on things like 250 quads as well as things like GoPro covers as well but there's also other pieces on here and we'll have a look at these as we go through the video. And what I'll do is kind of talk about some of the common considerations when you're about to ready to sit down and start designing your own bits and pieces for the hobby. Now in the next video we'll be talking about some of the problems that you can get into and some of the challenges that you can have. Uh, for example, there's this part that we'll look at in a minute. This is actually more for um, mounting a small strip of LEDs onto and it's going to clip onto one of the vertical limbs of my 3D printer and the idea is it's to shed light uh, in the darker evenings so that I can still see the printed part being done. Now this is the uh, result and this is the one that I actually printed that I'm going to use. This was one of my test prints. And you can probably see as the light reflects off it there's some real problems with it here and that's part of the learning process because not every print that you're going to do will come out fine and in fact if I hold this up to the camera so it think what happened here was as the material that it was printing was getting less and less the plastic wasn't quite getting enough time to cool down and the slightly soft plastic was being pulled by the head as it sorted out. Now the top it kind of goes okay again and that's because I reduced the print speed. So what we're going to do is we're kind of going to go through some of these pieces and some of the tips to help you avoid some of this nastiness because occasionally you will find that your prints won't work and over here, for example, we have um, a piece that actually, this is the version 3, actually went through two initial versions before I got it all figured out and it worked perfectly. So before you actually start to print anything, the first thing you need to do is to sit down and really think hard about what you're trying to design. Here's a bit of paper uh, with, and you can't really see it on here, but there's all kind of scribbles and designs on here. This is actually my initial kind of sketch and design uh, for this part here, which is the first version of this threesome on the left hand side. And then we have like another little sketch here, which was my idea for this mounted piece. So uh, the first thing I'd recommend is before you reach for your 3D printed software, take a little time, start measuring the piece that you're going to attach this stuff to. Typically these 3D printed parts don't exist in isolation, they're part of a model, so spend time and actually measure everything accurately. We've looked at vernier calipers earlier in the series, as well as good old fashioned rulers, and occasionally you might need to test print things. But you will need a couple of iterations if it's a brand new part that doesn't exist that you're having a play with. So expect to have a couple of test prints before you get to the one that works brilliantly and uh, becomes the bulletproof part that you use all the time. When you go into your software, there are lots of favourites. We've looked at two on the channel already. We've looked at, at something called SketchUp and 123D but we have looked at others as well, and there's loads of great comments underneath those videos where subscribers have offered their ideas for other types too. Some are better than others for designing things. We've done some basic stuff with things like SketchUp, and the reason I quite like SketchUp is as a graphic designer and a draftsman of old, then it kind of works in the same way as my brain does to design the pieces. So an awful lot of the stuff on the table, with a couple of notable exceptions, will have been designed in SketchUp. If you are using the technology and the software, but you find that you can't get the printed part easily out of the technology you're using, then think about changing it. You, I find that for some things like this part here, this is actually the front camera cover 
for, uh, for something like called a Hobby King Cloud Surfer. Now it's designed to replace the canopy that goes at the front, which is normally like a big Perspex dome, and this goes over the top, provides the same level of protection, but has a small insert so that you can actually pop in a flat piece of Perspex as well. It's optically a slightly better solution than the one that comes on that model. Now these wonderful curves and shapes and hollowing out um, is much easier to do in my opinion in 123D than SketchUp, so that's what I use for that. Do start small, use the online tutorials and learn new tricks. I'd recommend you know, trying things like the 20mm cube or trying things like this which is the little uh, GoPro lens cover. Uh, these are nice cute things to start out with and as your confidence grows and your experience with the software grows you can move on to more complicated uh, shapes. Uh, with different pieces in there as well. So don't expect when you sit down to design really complicated pieces straight off. Have a play and have fun and by sitting down with an idea of what you actually want to end up with it really makes you persevere with the pieces that are, you don't quite understand to get the right outcome. When you sit down and do your designing, do you think about the plastic you intend to use? Now most of these parts in front of us are actually uh, black PLA. Now, as we talked about, PLA is a nice cheap and cheerful plastic. It's really great to print with because it doesn't require particularly high temperatures uh, and it's reasonably dimensionally stable. So if you print something at 10.2 millimeters, when you measure it, it'll be roughly 10.2 millimeters. You don't need a heated bed either, so it's quite cute to print with. But it is a little bit fragile. So do think about that because some of the pieces that I designed to print in PLA would have thicker walls for additional support and rigidity and the ability to take knocks when on a remote control craft than if I was designing it for ABS. I could probably get away with a little bit less material because ABS will take those knocks without snapping or delaminating. Do you think about overhangs? So you can see here, for example, that this um, has a bevel on the side. Now that's just to make sure that this front face is 10 millimeters, which is perfect to pop the LEDs onto. Um, but I've it was actually printed this way round, so it was printed on the print bed like that. Now it does have some chamfers and some kind of covers. If the camera will catch up, there we go. Uh, but they are. Uh, substantially more than 45 degrees and the reason for that is it's easy for the printers to print. So when you are doing those kind of things do think about the small overhangs, do think about not having anything that's going to be difficult to print, consider having less support material. This one was one that was printed where that was the bottom and this was the top and most of it was fine. The only problem it got in trouble with um, is uh, this very top piece here. You can't quite see it because it's black plastic. There we go, that's not bad. And I've had to kind of finish that up with a little bit of um, sandpaper. And that's because there wasn't any support material in here. I thought I'd get away with it, but I didn't. If I was going to print this again, I'd probably add in a couple of little nubbins that uh, came out from the wall further down that would act as integrated support for that piece and provide a little bit of more mechanical uh, strength for the piece when it's actually on the model. Do you use the results from your calibration prints to print stuff out? Now with this, I wanted a hole uh, that was pretty much bang on 10 millimeters from side to side, or just slightly more, about 10.1, 10.2 millimeters was what I was after. Now I knew from our calibration prints that we did way back at the beginning of the series that it prints slightly larger. So what I had to do was take that into account when I was designing this and uh, put that in the middle. Also think about the actual weight for remote control. Now this arm I test printed with a 50% infill and unfortunately as you can see it's a little bit too flexible. So printing the next ones I actually used 100% infill so it gets printed as a solid plastic piece. Do think about though using where you don't need all of that, using voids and infill. So for example with this wrench I could have actually put a number of holes in here. Um, again smaller holes if it was going to be something like PLA, if it's going to be something like nylon you know you could have had quite large holes and it would still work fine. One to reduce the amount of plastic you're using but two to reduce the weight. 
Also consider layer direction. Now, what you'll find is when you start to put things together, sometimes they'll snap off. So here's the very first version of this uh, mount that I designed. Now, the way it works is that piece is supposed to be on here. Now, there are two problems with it. The first was as soon as I put the piece in and it rested against this bit, it snapped it off. So it actually delaminated. You can actually see there at the bottom you know, the it, it hasn't got enough material, it's just snapped off. So that's one lesson I learnt on version one. And the second was, it was printing way too fast. So again, just like on this piece here, when there isn't enough, enough material and you're printing too fast and the plastic isn't getting time to cool down, then you start to get all this lovely, horrible looking gubbins on the top of the print. Now you can sort that out, you can actually reduce the speed of the print from 100% down to, this would have probably been fine, at about 75-80% um, and that's okay. But because it delaminated, I printed and designed the second one, and this time that piece is a big piece at the front with also a little support. Um, that worked great, but this time the piece that de delaminated, if you can actually see that, is actually this piece at the back. So that was the disaster on that one. The third and final version was that same model, but this time you can probably see there's a lot more material around that backstop. So now this one works great. But that's a great example of when you're designing for remote control, how sometimes the things like layer direction, the amount of material can catch you out. Do you also think about layer height? Most of the stuff on the table is printed at about 0.2 layer resolution. Uh, that one was actually printed at 0.3 because it was a reasonably large piece and I wanted to uh, be able to do other things that day. So I would say that for most remote control parts, 0.2 millimeters is gonna be fine. So every five layers printed, it's done a millimeter of your model. But if you want more control, more support, then I would say that a 0.3 is great for faster prints. And it also, in my experience, provides a little bit more resilience for the part as well. Think about top, bottom layers and shells. So a shell, and you can see it really on this part here, is as it goes around the outside, you can see there's kind of the lines, which is almost like pencil lines around the outside, and then the infill. These parts around the outside, this is the shell. Now I've got three shells, so there's actually three of these lines and then it's filling in the middle. If you're going to print parts that have a lot of space in, um, having more of these can be useful for support because they bond really well and the top and bottom layers is how many times it prints. So if we actually snapped this open, which I'm not gonna do, you'll find that inside is a honeycomb and it has a solid top and it has a reasonably solid bottom and then we have these shells around the outside. So it's like a pie crust of solid plastic with voids in the middle. The thicker the pie crust, the stronger the part will be. And sometimes when you're printing parts with lots of very gentle curves, having more external shells helps the plastic kind of keep its shape as you print it. Do you think about whether or not support material is printed? I always try and design my parts so you need the minimum of support material possible. And finally, I would always check that the model mesh is fine. The STL files that you get out of your design software or the ones you're downloading from the internet aren't always perfect. Some of the geometry that's been designed into the actual shape itself can have problems. And when you then go to slice it, those problems are exhibited in problems with a slice where maybe layers are uh, affected or parts of the model won't print at all. So in those cases, what I would say is if you go into your slicing software or Repetier host and you do that analysis that we've done earlier in the series where you click the button and things appear red, you have a couple of options. First thing to comment on is that some software is easier to make STL files that have problems than others. I find that SketchUp is really easy to make STL files that don't have um, consistency, whereas things like 123D seems a much um, more stable program, and if you do some quite wacky stuff in there, it still seems to print really well. 
there are great services like Matter Control, and if you also Google Microsoft 3D File Fixer, you'll find this website. Now, this is one that I've used a couple of times where I've had models that I've used in SketchUp. I've done my best to try and repair them. It still isn't perfect. And by loading the file into the Microsoft 3D File Fixing website, I'll put a link in the description uh, so you can find it, then I can, it's uploaded, it's, they fix it, and then it's then you click on the download button, save it back to your desktop, and the next time you come to look at it, it'll be sorted. It's a great way to save yourself a lot of time and hassle, and it's very useful for those STL files that you download from places like Thingiverse. So in summary, designing a part in 3D software is like any other process, form follows function. Don't expect to get it right every time. I would say simplify what you need. An example of this is this wrench that we designed originally, uh, designed to go and undo these 10 millimeter bolts. This was my first version. This is what I finally ended up with after several iterations. It's smaller, thinner, faster to print, and it also has the ability to actually undo 180 style motors as well. Do design the part roughly on paper and be accurate about any of the measurements. Now, one of the things that I wasn't sure about when I printed this big part was the actual diameter of this piece. So what I did as a trick was I guessed what the diameter was. I took my best guess and then I printed out a very simple halo of plastic on the 3D printer with the size that I thought it was and I went and stuck this on the model to double check and it was perfect. Once I was happy that that was the diameter that I needed to have in the 3D printer, then I went on and printed the entire piece. So do take time to measure everything. And if you're not sure, do some test printing with little pieces before you commit your printer to run for four hours on the main part. And also when you come into slicing, do think about some of your settings because it's part of the design process and it's always worthwhile talking about that when you're sharing your models with anybody else. So I would say think about the number of top and bottom shells, think about the um, the, the number of uh, outside runs too. Think about how much fill material you actually need in order to get the results from the part that you want for your model. Have fun, enjoy it. Don't expect to get everything right first time. Everything is a bit of a learning experience. Uh, I will In the next video, we'll actually talk about some of the common gotchas and how you can get better prints from your model STL and G-code files. But for now, we'll leave it there. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.